Hi, my name is Ranzo of the Melanated Files. We've interviewed over 100 people right across Asia, black people primarily. And there's one answer that seems to be consistent that I receive no matter who I interview, no matter where they're from, there's one answer that is the same amongst a very diverse group of people. It does not matter if these black people hailed from Africa, Europe, the Caribbean, North America, wherever, this answer seems very, very consistent whether we asked the men or the women, what do you like the most about this country in Asia or that country in Asia? And the question that we're gonna try to answer with this documentary is why are black people moving to Asia? So what do you like the most about Japan? This may sound a little strange, a little hyperbolic, but here in Japan, mm -hmm. I am a free black man. Oh. I came here when I was 21. Mm -hmm. and it's the first time, well, I was almost 40 years ago. The, the third, next January will be 38 years ago, nearly 40 years ago. But living here, I feel free. I don't fear the police. I don't fear white people. I don't fear black people. <laughs> I don't fear yellow people. I feel like a free black man. He actually, a, just a free man. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not exaggerating here. I forgive me if it sounds hyperbolic, but no, really. If for some drastic reason Japan changes, I may have to go somewhere else. No one has ever broken into my car or robbed my house. Sometimes I forget to lock the door. <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, I go to sleep and the door is wide open, and, you know, literally wide open. <laughs> you know, and I don't get bothered. I don't get robbed. I don't get physically assaulted. And if that's not freedom, I don't know what is. I'm Robert Jefferson. I live here in Kamakura, Japan, which is south of Yokohama and south of Tokyo. About an hour south of Tokyo, a half hour south of Yokohama. I am a broadcast journalist. I've been in Japan for almost 38 years. I've been a broadcast journalist for 43 years. And um, currently I work for Japan's public broadcaster, NHK, Nippon Hoso Kyokai, the Japan Broadcasting Corporation. And I'm also an adjunct professor at Temple University. I teach uh, the history of journalism and ethical issues in journalism. My name is Nima Okal. I am originally from Kenya, but I've lived in the US most of my life. And now I currently, I am living in Singapore and we are at Marina Bay Sands. Salivunani, Ibuzolami Ngaveni Butolezwe Msimanga. My name is Ngaveni Butolezwe Msimanga. I'm originally from Zimbabwe. Um, but otherwise, out here in Singapore, where I live, I'm known as Q. Everyone calls me Q because Agula Mundu, who can say Ngabeni, no one can say that word, that name. Um, and I have been in Singapore for seven years. So I'm a menswear designer, I'm a personal stylist, I'm a tailor, um, and an all round fabric enthusiast. And I operate my own brand known as The Prefecture uh, Fine Menswear. So I specialize in personalized, customized wardrobes for people. Well, I think black people are moving to Asia is because they are seeking something new, something different, um, something safer. Uh, I think physically we're safer here. Uh, opportunistically, there's more going on here. We can follow our dreams. We can experience new things, things we never thought we'd ever do before. And uh, whether it's Japan or China or Vietnam or South Korea or Singapore, wherever, new doors are opening, new vistas are, are on the horizon. And I think that is what we as a people need. 
Why are black people moving to Asia? I think it's because of experience, but also because there, black people are realizing that we are not limited to what people have always told us. We have a world out there that is bigger, and we have an opportunity to really showcase people that we have black excellence everywhere we go to. I don't think there's so much of an exodus, and even if there is, um, I think it seems there are more simply because media is more open now. We all access media, there's so much more going on on media. So uh, the perception, I think it's just that the fact that we can see more people uh, like us around Asia and around different places of the world, um, it seems that we are traveling more. And I think to an extent we are because it's tra traveling is cheaper. Um, so there are definitely more. But why Asia in particular? Because Asia is, it's a, it's, a, it's a completely new frontier from what we know. We either know our homestead or we know Europe or we know the West as in America, but the East is a new frontier and I do think it's because it's much more open, uh, it's more welcoming. Um, the cultures um, are, are kinder, if I can say that. Um, I think the cultures are much more open to the idea of people exploring and, and, and being open to them. Indeed, Asia is one of the safest places on earth for black people. Uh, when you look back in history, for example, the Chinese and Africans have been doing trade for, for centuries. And China never went there to take over them. They simply wanted to trade. And we're seeing that again. Our Western corporate media isn't telling us that. But we're simply seeing history repeat itself. I don't know how to answer that. But me being here in Singapore, I feel pretty safe. I think I've been here for a few months and so far I've been so good. So I'm excited. I think I plan to be here for a few more years and I'm hoping that it's still going to be safe as I've experienced the last few months. Is Asia the safest place for black people? I, I, I don't know about safe first um, because you're, no, you're never any safer than you are at home. Right? Um, and is it the safest place? I think in as far as traveling the world, yes. I think in as far as traveling the world, it just is much more welcoming. Uh, I think it's more open because of, I think the, the, there's a synergy between the fact that Asia is exploding. It's so much more open, the opportunities, and um, they themselves are going out into the rest of the world and trading. Therefore, there is almost like a, 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 a population exchange. Although I don't think we're traveling in such numbers that we're gonna change or skewer any populations. But I do think that uh, it, it just feels safer simply because it's not stuck in the same old ways that the West has been for so long. Which, funny enough, the West constructed on its own falsely, but I think that um, Asia is, is, is not tied down by those same um, negatives. <laughs> There's a lot of things, little subtle things that I do in Japan or has done that's, you know, makes me feel at home. Um, but if I compare it to other experiences I've had as a black man, uh, the safety and the, the lack of police, like racial profiling, and even if you do have some sort of interaction with the police, I mean, there's, you know, you never, I don't, I've never talked to anyone who at any time started feeling f in fear in, a, you know, in some f sort of physical way. Um, and I saw your video when you got stopped over <laughs> in Tokyo. And yeah, I mean, yeah, at, at best it's, it's troublesome. I don't really, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, um, you were a lot nicer than I am, but, um, but I don't think at any time you ever think like, hey, these guys are gonna, you know, throw me down in the hood and, and really just embarrass me and, you know. So yeah, I mean, how can you not like that? In the U.S., I don't really feel like I have time to think with, you know, like I said, I'm looking around. You got to make sure no one's watching you and, and stuff like that, especially like in New York City. But here, you know, someone's looking at you, okay, put on your headphones and, and go into a whole other world. And, and, and nine times, I even say more than nine times out of ten, 99 times out of 100, it's not going to be anything more than someone maybe looking at you kind of rudely. You know, like today I told you when I came here, it's raining a little bit outside. Um, today and I have a, a you know a, a disposable umbrella and somebody uh, exchanged the umbrella and they, they might have done it on purpose they might have done it by accident 
Um, but that's about the worst thing that, that it happens. I've left my bag on trains and gotten it back with money in it. So, you know. To be honest, as a black person, here in Sapporo, it's been pretty good. Um, like I said, this is the, the safest I've ever felt. Um, living in America, living in the United Kingdom, living here in Sapporo as a black person, this is the safest that I've ever felt in my life. The most significant way Japan differs from my home country is that it differs in every way imaginable. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I guess I go back to, to the peace. Um, I think for me as a black person, I've always grown up hearing the, 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 the notion you have to put on your armor and armor up before you leave the house and you enter out into the world. And while I think that there's still that reality that as a black individual, wherever you are, there's a certain armor that you have to still wear. I find living here, I don't feel I need to be armored up. And when I walk out the house, I have to be ready to go and just ready at all times. Um, I think that for me is the most significant difference is that just that peace of mind that I have and that ability to not have to prepare myself and armor up before I leave the house. The biggest difference I think between here and the UK or the US or anywhere really that I've been, because I've done some traveling, anywhere I've been before coming here, uh, I feel like, so the US is maybe not particularly physically safe. The UK is not particularly physically safe. Korea is very physically safe. Like I could walk around in the middle of the night in this neighborhood at 2 a.m. and it's safe. Uh, but Korea is not emotionally safe at all. Uh, whereas I feel like in the UK and the US there's a lot more emotional and social safety. Whereas that doesn't, that's not a thing in Korea. Uh, I don't know if it's different for native Koreans, but I know as an expat I definitely feel I'll, sometimes a little bit you're just you're tender emotionally. Like there's a lot of things coming at you emotionally speaking. The biggest difference, matter of fact, is the safety. Biggest difference is the safety. I remember talking to my cousins. They, they don't even believe me. When I tell them you can walk around two in the morning, both headphones in your ear, nighttime, and be straight, they didn't believe me. They was like, nah, we don't believe you. But I'm like, for real, like you really can't do that. If you was a woman, I wouldn't advise doing it. No disrespect. But you know, violence towards women or, or you know, female related crimes, unfortunately, statistically are higher than they are towards men uh, because it's a lot, of, a lot of cowards out here that, that, uh, that find women to be easy prey. But um, in general, it is a lot safer in Korea than it is in America, most definitely. Overall, my experience in China has been, I, was, I hate to say sad to say, better than in the States because I feel like uh, there's no, I'm not ignorant to the world we live in, you know, there's no place in the world where I can outrun my blackness, but I feel like being in China, my person is never in danger. There are ignorant people everywhere, there are curious people everywhere, there are just, you know, neutral people everywhere, but I feel like I've never been physically in danger because of how I look. It's safe. I think if, if for people who come to China and don't know anything about it right now, it is safe. Like, safe. And I think this is someone coming from the States. Uh, being a black man, this place is safe. I've never felt like my person was in danger. You know, I think the biggest crimes that happen to me are like petty crime, maybe a pickpocket here, uh, but it's safe. And this is not just me, but even for like my female friends, they never feel like walking home at five in the morning is a danger to them, especially in the bigger cities. Now, smaller cities I can't really attest to, but I've never felt more safe in my life. What's something that Japan does really well that the world can learn from? Security, safety, mm -hmm. safety. So Japan is the only country I would ever even dream of <laughs> going out at night by myself yeah. and have no worries whatsoever. So I, I like to have, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I like to go to Rapongi <laughs> mm -hmm. and I do it on my own, like mm -hmm. all the time. I never have to look like over my shoulder. I never have to worry about something being stolen from me. Um, you, there might be altercations here and there, but it's really so, 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 so safe. It's even too safe because then you, you let your guard down. So mm -hmm. when you travel internationally, it's like, oh, you have to pick up all the senses and mm -hmm. come back to, you know, 
of being alert. So yeah. I think the way Japan is safe is something that everybody could learn from. Singapore, I would say for as a black person, I mean, yeah, it's very mentally healing. Here. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's very, very peaceful. One thing I have to say about China and about Asia in general, uh, my, my experience is that the blood isn't really in the sand here mm. from a historical standpoint. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, um, the comments or maybe, let's say, statements that are made uh, related to black people, I think there's not much historical context mm -hmm. as to what it could mean to that person. Like, they, don't, they probably wouldn't even realize that things could be hurtful or offensive because there, there was no civil rights movement for black people here. There wasn't a, a need for it. It didn't happen here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what might be like, oh, you know, commenting on someone's tone or, um, you know, complexion. Mm -hmm. That's a delicate and very, uh, you have to be kind of a professional linguist to have a complexion conversation in America. Mm -hmm. So that comes from the historical context where like in Asia or in China, they'll just say it like, oh, you're really dark. And you're kind of like, well, it's, it takes you back from it. Like, okay, that's not a problem. I like being dark. But the way you said that was so direct yeah. <laughs> that you're like, whoa. Mm -hmm. But then you realize, oh, you, you're just telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's not you're just you know there, there there's no issue there there's no yeah. underlying point intent. there where like you know the concept of saying you know light dark in the states it comes with a with a zinger mm -hmm. or something else behind it yeah. where you know you're meant to feel a certain type of way about it where in in asia there is no historical context so you don't have the same kind of building blocks behind it so i think the feeling of safety out here is 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 manifold um I will start by saying I'm, I'm very much the kind of person I, through, through, the way I, through the way I was taught by my parents is that um, your, your skin shouldn't be a weight. It should be an asset. It should be, your, uh, it should be something that's either an asset or just something you, sh you yourself should be indifferent to. You are just as human as any other person with a different color skin. But we add much more weight to our own skin color sometimes. And I think too often we add a negative weight because of the way we have been conditioned in Western society, that's one. Um, but if I was to touch on the idea of why do we feel safer in Asia? Because this place is not conditioned with five, 600 years of writing a, spe a specific narrative about, about us. All right, so that also means that if you yourself are of the mindset of not being held down or of not viewing yourself, your skin color as um, a hindrance, then you will only see that your skin color is an opportunity just as much in, a, in the same way as it has been for me. So I think part of that safety feeling is simply because of the fact that you are not amongst people who are preconditioned over centuries, over five, six hundred years of believing that you are by nature to be feared, right? That, that doesn't exist over here. You know, uh, you can even, and even if you encounter it in anyone, you can quell it in a very, very short time, right? Because within a five minute engagement, you can make anyone realize that, oh, okay, well, whatever prejudice I had would clearly have, do not exist in this person, you know? And after some time, I think it's about being at ease enough, being at enough ease with yourself to realize that if you're not a threat to yourself, how could you possibly be a threat to anybody else? You are an asset wherever you go. And you really have to train yourself to believe that and realize that. Black people have contributed so much to Asia, especially in the 20th. And here we are in the first two decades of the 21st century. I mean, just look at, look at culture, look at the arts, look at music. We've contributed so much. And I've noticed how young Asian men look up to black men as examples of what masculinity is or can be. They're looking to us. I think we have an opportunity to change the culture that most some of the Asians have about us. We can change to show them that there is more to us than what the media portrays as a whole. But also because we all come from different countries across Africa, but also in the Caribbean and in the US and everywhere else, it's a good opportunity to showcase where we are from, who we are, and that starts by us living here and really showing them who we are and changing the narrative through that work. I would only encourage young, middle-aged, real older black men to come to Asia if you think you have something to offer. If you're coming for a free ride, don't come. 
If you think you have something to offer, come, offer it. There are so many black men who preceded me, who've come after me, who have been able to help provide skills, knowledge, education to people here in Japan or people in, 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 in Korea, South Korea, China, wherever, but they're giving something. They are contributing. And that's what we need, people who come and contribute. Do black people have something to contribute to Asia? Most definitely. Um, and again, escape, extricate yourself from um, thinking that you are only black. Right? Like, that really is, you, you're robbing yourself of so much more. <laughs> you know, you're not only black, you are a person first and foremost. You are human first and foremost. You are an educated mind. You are, uh, you know, you, you're an individual. Treat yourself strictly as an individual and you, it just so happens that you're black. You know, and that's a great thing, you, you add to that. So do we have something to contribute to Asia? If we didn't, we wouldn't be here. If we didn't, there'd be so many things that wouldn't be happening as a cross-pollination of the African and Asian cultures, right? There's a lot happening in Africa being done by Asians and vice versa. So we um, need to do the same thing, right? Explore those opportunities and bring, literally, as I said, assets. We are all assets, so bring the tools that you want to contribute to their societies in the same way that they're doing back in ours rather than being defensive or protective. Uh, so you, there's, you, you have a lot to offer. You, you should know that as an individual, not just as a black person. Do I think the presence of black people in Asia will improve the image? Absolutely. Look at us. We excel in everything that we do. We're, we are showing them that you know what, there's more to us than what they think the news they see. We are teaching them about our culture. And more and more, you see more Asians now traveling to Africa. I go to South Africa and it's pretty much so many Asians there. So I think us being here also gives them an opportunity to learn about us and then they're interested in going abroad to see how it is to also visit Africa and places like that. I think there are more opportunities actually for, for black people in Asia um, because Asia itself is exploding uh, with its growth, with its wealth, um, and the more growth there is, the more business opportunities there are. And the more business opportunities there are, the more attractive it is to wider and wider demographics, uh, such as ours, um, irrespective of which part of the black community you come from, whether you come from, uh, Af they are, uh, from Africa or uh, further west in, in the Americas, I do think Asia just feels and is ultimately more open uh, to all of us. Um, and I think they, they are definitely more willing to I think here everything is governed by what do you have to bring to the table and I, ge I genuinely believe that wherever anyone goes they are an asset. Uh, I'm an asset wherever I go. I know that much for a fact and I bring that much to any table that I, uh, uh, is, I'm, allowed, uh, I'm sort of accepted to take a seat in and I do think everyone else ought to carry themselves uh, in the same way that you are an asset uh, and then you, you will find more opportunities. So just recently, I actually switched to do a position in-house, where now I'll be doing HR specialist for one of the major IT companies. I'm really excited for that. And I realized that that position that I got, I would never have had the opportunity to work in that type of role if I was back in Canada. Because that job, one, requires people who can speak Japanese and English, but also it's because I am in Japan, that was just the right place at the right time kind of situation. So I always feel that if I was Back in Canada, I'll probably working at some, I don't know, normal office job, you know, being maybe the secretary or something like that. But being here in Japan, I've just been afforded so much more wide range of opportunity that I never would have had back home. If you come to Japan, as for me, as a writer especially, I find that I, I, I have time where I can cultivate myself because I can, can't, the outside distractions that are here are not really catered to me per se. Uh, I can, you know, be distracted. I can partake in those things. And now with the internet, you can look and do any, go anywhere. But I, I know when I'm in other countries, especially like Canada, the U.S., or some of the Western countries, I can't really get, and this is just me personally, I, I seem to remain distracted on different things. And some of it is good, but I don't feel as though I'm, I'm moving forward 
in, you know, as a person or in my craft, I should say. So I think uh, coming here, I think if you're gonna come here, you should come here and um, understanding that, you, that that opportunity is there for you and you should try to cultivate something because you really have time as uh, well, a great writer, Chancellor Williams says in one of his books, he talks about you know just being a, a safe environment where you have time to think. Come now. Any advice for black people kind of trying to come now? Just buy the ticket. <laughs> Just get on the plane and just come right now because it's not as bad as you think it is. It's, it's not as bad as you think it is. And it's probably a lot more fun than you expect it to be. There's more opportunity here. Not necessarily saying there's less opportunity where you're from, but there's opportunity here that is just open opportunity. I think for black people who want to just travel around the world, I think China, just East Asia in general, it's I don't want to say it's a fair shot, but it's a, you get a fair shot at opportunity. It's a fair shot, and I think that's just what most people want. So I would say just buy the ticket and I'll get on TripAdvisor or Expedia, whatever you're doing, just buy the ticket, pay the $1,000, 800 euro, 700 pounds, just get on the plane, go to the cities. I'm not a big fan of the tier two cities or tier three cities, even though they're like four or five million people in each of those. but I would just say come to Shanghai, go to Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and just live a little bit. I do make more money in China. I make way more money in China. Way more money. Okay, so um, the average, sal the yearly salary of a Chinese, uh, Chinese person in Beijing is about $17,000 per year. That's $17,000 per year, right? I'm well over 40. And that being said, I take premium taxis everywhere well. Like everywhere well. What do you like the most about South Korea, like right now? To me, freedom. Mm. What do you mean? Yeah, like to travel. To travel, to so much experience easy, right? ah, like life. Yeah. Other countries around. Um, not just that, just mm. the accessibility, just the affordability of mm -hmm. life here mm -hmm. in terms of difference in the states. And like in the states, most people say they go to work, our school, they go home because mm -hmm. you can't afford anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's like having, how do you say, a life is very, it's kind of difficult for a college graduate in the states because first off, you're paying back your loans, mm -hmm. and then you have your apartment, then you have your apartment or your house, you know, bill, then you have your insurance, your car payment, your mm -hmm. phone payment, and then you better hope you don't get sick because <laughs> that's expensive. Yeah. And yeah. so it's like you're working paycheck to paycheck, and no matter how much money you make. It's it seems like you're always in the red yeah. but it's like since we've come across seas it's like we can breathe yeah. freedom <laughs> yeah it's freedom yeah. we can go out to eat I and mean, go get a massage make a trip to Seoul and go shopping if we want to mm -hmm. you know it's like the little things that honestly we didn't realize we were missing out in the states yeah. you can experience I think Japan is very good if you want and very a good great place for possibilities like if you want to open your own school, you want to open your own company, you want to do something completely different, it's up to you. I really think Japan is like that. I feel like if I was in America, I wouldn't have the same opportunities that are allowed to me here. So I feel like that's probably my favorite part of being in Japan is just, you know, being able to create these opportunities and take full advantage of them. I can only speak about myself, but I do think what attracted me to Asia does also apply to other people, which is um, opportunity, right? Uh, the idea of exploring opportunities, the idea of um, exploring new places. As any human being, uh, we learn so much more when we explore. We learn a lot more, we accumulate more knowledge, more intelligence, more spirituality, uh, more wealth, intellectual wealth, when we travel. So I think uh, to travel is an extraordinary gift and a blessing. Um, so I think that's what's making us travel. <laughs> Uh, a lot of us are driven, but also the West, there, there are so many hindrances. Uh, one of the drives for me to moving out here was just um, a, a, an unquantifiable and intangible weight of being drawn, of being held back, right? Uh, it's intangible, you can't quantify it, you can't name it, but you know it's there. So it's a weight of being held back. But I, I also think this applies not just to um, black people or Africans traveling to Asia. I think everyone, wherever you're born, 
uh, you ought to leave uh, and go somewhere else for two to five years, right? Uh, because as the old saying goes, familiarity breeds resentment. So even Singaporeans uh, get frustrated and they, sometimes they vent about Singapore and they get frustrated by it. But that's because they've lived here so long. And any, uh, when you're so familiar with the place, you only know it as an A to B place. But for me as, a, as an outsider, I look at it with 180 degrees of eyesight. Right. Um, therefore, I see more opportunity than somebody who's born and raised here. And I think that's what makes that, that's what should encourage people to travel. Even if you move from London to Paris, you would see much more of Paris than a native Parisian would. So I think generally speaking, the whole world should just shift around every once in a while. It should be mandatory for people to travel um, because you really do refresh the perspective and you refresh your gears and you fuel up. You definitely get a lot more fuel from it. Do I need to move to Africa with my education? Absolutely. And how do you do that? I learned that the best way for me to relocate from California to Asia and then to Africa is by coming to Asia, learning about the culture and being really, because right now, if you look at Africa, Asia, China, they're investing so much in Africa. And the only way for me to be able to do business with them, be competitive as I need to be, is to learn about the culture, learn about everything that they do, so that when I move back home in a few years, I have both of the worlds. I still have that American education and American working lifestyle with Asian experience. You can't beat that. I think that's a brilliant, brilliant question, actually, and it's completely valid. It's a re it's a, it really and truly is a valid question. Um, I would say, speaking um, of myself, um, I was the product of parents, like many other people of my generation, millions. Um, there are millions of Zimbabweans outside of Zimbabwe. Um, and I think a lot of us who are outside were people who moved, as when I was very young, moved to England, because um, our parents saw an opportunity to seek uh, economic prosperity, you know, like um, to, to build um, we were economic migrants. It wasn't necessarily out of desperation. It was uh, a case of, I'm going to go abroad and educate. I have an uncle who, in the, 19, in the early 70s, at 31 years old, moved to Romania and studied medicine in Romanian, right? Uh, and then he went back to Zimbabwe and, you know, opened surgeries. So I think it was more a case of economic migration um, to just broaden our prospects and opportunities. But in, in that case, as we get older, people like myself, yes, are accountable to how do we therefore um, return our talents back home? Um, how, do we, how, yeah, how do we give back to, to the continent from whence we came? Um, and that is a really, really big question. So why are we not taking those to our talents back? I think um, fear, and I don't think that fear is justified at all, but we have been um, unfortunately polluted by the idea of fear, you know, fear of going back, fear of feeling like if you go home, if you go back home, you're going backwards, but you're not. Um, that's kind of like an, a more internalized uh, irrational, irrationality that a lot of us have internalized that, oh, to go back home is to go backwards. But on a more quantifiable basis, and I spoke to someone very recently who um, said that the, Africa's greatest challenge is not that it's uh, its talent in the diaspora doesn't want to go back. It's the fact that the infrastructure that exists at the moment um, doesn't feel like it, it doesn't accommodate uh, for that um, diaspora to come back. And I think also for my generation, we will have to at some point just tighten up our, our, our boots, uh, you know, pull our bootstraps and say, you know what, the infrastructure is not great. But we're, somebody has to walk through that, foot, the, you know, that first mile. Somebody has to cover that first mile, that first rough, um, unrefined mile. And we are the ones that are going to have to spearhead any sense of um, uh, building an infrastructure. I do think that's what needs to happen. That, so, so one of us has to, or so some of us, a, swa a group of us has to, has to be brave enough to go back um, and start from the ground up because by virtue of having been out here for so long you have you we have accumulated so much knowledge so much talent so much skill an extraordinary level of education which we can then go back home and you know reinvest so that's the best investment we can bring back to africa the education and experiences that we have accumulated from around the world
we as the diaspora who are not back in Africa yet, and I emphasize the word yet, right, is because I'd like to think optimistically that we are accumulating knowledge and crucially skills that we are going to take back home and use to be able to replicate how other places have made themselves efficient. At least individually, that's absolutely what I'm doing, right? Accumulating the wealth of knowledge, uh, skills, uh, and being able to just to bring another piece of the world back home. When you bring treasures, and not necessarily physical or material treasures, but when you bring informational treasures from around the world, you can come back and add to the wealth of where you come from. What do I think black people can do as a collective to improve the image across the globe? I think we just need to keep being ourselves and keep showing our black excellence, but also that always, if you have an opportunity to teach somebody to think about you differently, think about the continent differently, think about black culture differently, do it. I think that's one of the best ways you can be able to do it. But also keep traveling, keep seeing the world, keep changing the narrative by going to places you've never been and showing them who you truly are. So I'm a great believer in something that I, or something that I refer to as the power of the anomaly, right? Um, I always believe that whenever anything, uh, in fact, the greatest piece of advice I heard in, in business was observe the masses and do the opposite, right? And whenever you do the opposite, you are taking a huge risk because you could be washed away by the current, so to speak, right? Um, it's a much riskier and much more costly process in the beginning but being an anomaly really does make you stand out and once you know you're standing out then it is incumbent upon you to take advantage of it by shining in whatever skills or expertise you have so I think that as an anomaly as an anomaly an anomaly in Asia um, I just find that I've, many more doors have been open uh, I get interactions that I know I would otherwise not have um, I, I, I get doors are open by people who would otherwise not have opened it if I was back in London, right? Um, so I think when you are an anomaly, it is an advantage. It is a massive advantage and you have to capitalize on that, right? Um, and also in so doing, you, you begin to teach those people that your being an anomaly is not about your skin. So initially it was. When you walked into a room, you were an anomaly because of your skin. But now you have to prove that your being an anomaly is to do with real substance, real skill. You've brought something to the table, right? Uh, and when you do that, the more you do that, the more you show that you've brought something to the table, you've brought a skill, you've brought uh, some expertise, right? The more you realize that your racial disposition gets further and further and further away from everybody's mind. If you're black from the US, I think that there are a lot of things that you can, you could take from an experience like this, like, like, and not everybody hates us. Like we're, we're not, you know, like, like in America, we, we get a bad rep, but like here, like they don't know, like it's not the same. Like you, we, we, we have the ability to kind of start over and like create our own path here and, you know, do what, you know, what we want to do, which is normally just like live a normal life like without all the extra hurdles and struggles that we have to go through, especially in America. I'm Robert Jefferson, and here in Asia, I'm a free black man. My name is Nima Okal, and I am black, but originally from Kenya, living in Singapore. I am Ngaveni Butolezu Simanga. I am Q, black and living in Asia, in Singapore, and doing what I can. So of course, no country or region is without its challenges. Asia is no different. If you want a more in-depth look into the experiences of these black people and more across Asia, check out the videos on this channel in our Melanated Files series for a more in-depth look. Also, thank you so much for watching. Please like this video and remember to subscribe for weekly videos on the black experience across the globe. Remember our mission is to lambast the negative stereotypes of black people across the globe, repairing, restoring our image. You can also find us on Instagram at TheBlackXJP, on Facebook as well. You can visit our website as well. You can send us an email as well. All the links will be in the description down below. Thank you again for watching. Until next time, bye for now.